Order. The sitting is resumed. It is time for questions to the Minister for the Environment. And I have to tell you that question one and question four have been withdrawn. I call Mr. Paul Girvin. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Uh, question number two, please. Uh, the Northern Ireland Environment Agency, NIEA, is continuing to investigate the cause of a serious fish kill which occurred on Wednesday, the 29th of October, on the Six Mile Water at Ballyclare, County Antrim. As part of the investigation into this fish kill carried out by the NIEA in conjunction with Decal Inland Fisheries, a large body of evidence was gathered. This included the collection of statutory samples from several premises, a detailed biological survey of the Six Mile Water and its tributaries in this area, and a detailed survey of the numbers and spread of fish deaths. Interviews under caution are also being conducted as part of the process. Standard protocol and incidents of this nature is that these interviews under caution are conducted in writing, and it is anticipated that it will be several more weeks before this process is complete. Once the interviews under caution are complete, NIEA will review all of the evidence and make a decision on appropriate enforcement action. You will appreciate that because this remains an ongoing investigation, with evidence still being gathered from some parties, it would not be appropriate at this stage for me to comment further on the premises that are under investigation, as this might threaten the success of any future enforcement action. I can, however, assure you that this remains a live investigation and that NIEA is following definite lines of inquiry. Once the investigation is complete, I am no longer constrained and I am no longer constrained by legal considerations. I will, of course, be happy to provide you with a further update. Well, Mr. German, for supplementary. I th thank the Minister for his answer and uh, I appreciate that if there is further investigations ongoing uh, with view to prosecution, that would be fine to, to wait on that information coming through. But uh, I, I do believe that there was a further incident in, uh, in October as well, where the Bally Martin, 22nd of October, where the Bally Martin of November, where the Bally Martin River was, was um, polluted. Uh, and I'm wondering if the Minister is aware of any investigations into that incident, which is also another tributary into the Six Mile Water. Thank you, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And I, I thank Mr. Gervin for his question and a subsequent supplementary question on this topic that I know is very close to his own heart. It's, it's one on which we had an adjournment debate one or two weeks ago. I am aware of the more recent incident to which the member re refers. Uh, I assure him the Environment Agency are also aware of it and are currently investigating. Mr. Danny Kinnahan. Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answers, um, and I look forward to hearing many of the issues that we raised in that debate. But does the Minister believe that the current penalties are effective as a deterrent, and especially deterring public bodies, if that's indeed who's at fault? And does he have any idea why he thinks they're not working? Uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I thank Mr. Kinnahan. Uh, this is an issue that was raised again during the course of that ad adjournment debate, and there is evidence to suggest that fines for polluters are indeed lower in this jurisdiction than they are in other jurisdictions on this island. However, the scale or, or nature of, of punishment for these crimes is beyond the, the remit of me as Environment Minister, and it is very much a matter for the courts. It is something that I, during that adjournment debate, said I would be raising with uh, the Minister of Justice, and I fully in intend to do so. I am, however, given to understand that the average pollution fine imposed by courts here in Northern Ireland has increased significantly in recent years, and fines of thousands of pounds are now routine. Of course, we don't want them to be routine. We don't want incidents of pollution to be routine. But uh, for offences as serious as this, I believe that there should be serious penalties and uh, deterrence, particularly for potentially repeat offenders. 
call Ms. Anna Lu. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I think whilst it is important to have enforcement and increasing fines as deterrent, I think the most important thing is really prevention. Although it is very difficult to have preventative measures, I just want to ask the Minister what then uh, preventative measures the NIEA is taking to prevent these very serious damaging events. Well, uh, the, the agency works in conjunction with other bodies, uh, primarily DECAL and Land Fisheries, on prevention of incidents like this. Unfortunately, we're not able to prevent <laughs> every incident, and it's impossible to measure how many events we have prevented through our proactive work. I know in this specific geographical area, quite a lot of work had been done, not just uh, among and between government agencies, but also other stakeholders uh, and, and, and anglers on the river. I believe that locals and local anglers have embraced this work uh, very positively, played a very important role in it. I think this is the way that this should be addressed. Prevention is obviously uh, better than cure. Uh, the Environment Agency and, and DECAL Inland Fisheries also visited all premises a, 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 along this uh, stretch of water in the not too distant past to look at pollution risks and advise businesses of those same risks. Uh, many of the businesses then subsequently uh, put in mitigation measures to avoid the likes of this, uh, these disasters happening. I call Mr. Cahill Washing. The Minister will be aware that the length of time that it takes on occasions between the actual incident and the detection of the source and also the subsequent prosecution is in some cases very, very significant, and sometimes that is down to the manner in which it is first reported. Uh, will the Minister ensure that the Environment Agency look at the procedures within those cases? Uh -oh, uh Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and uh, thank Mr. Ohashin. I think it, it, it's vitally important that, well, in my answer to Ms. Lowe, I outlined the importance of a proactive approach to preventing incidents of this type, that whenever these incidents do occur, our reactions are sharp and swift and successful. Uh, if th there is an issue with how quickly or otherwise government agencies respond to incidents of this nature, then it's obviously uh, something I would like to address and, uh, and see addressed. I'd happily uh, speak with the member, I know he has a keen interest in angling himself and indeed other members who do, to hear their suggestions as to how this might be improved. Well, Mr Fergal McKinney for a question. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Question number three. Firstly, I want to stress that community planning is not just for local government. From the 1st of April 2015, new community planning duties will be placed on both central and local government. The Local Government Act 2014 sets out the process by which councils will lead community planning and, working with their community planning partners, identify long-term objectives for improving the social, economic and environmental well-being of the district. The Act also places a duty on all 12 central government departments to promote and encourage community planning and have regard for community plans. The Community Planning Partnership will provide leadership in each council area by bringing together the key organisations and people. To ensure this happens, I am making regulations to name those bodies that will be required to participate in the process as statutory community plan planning partners. The consultation on these regulations started on the 17th of October. I would encourage all those with an interest in community planning to provide responses to this public consultation, which closes on the 12th of December. Given the key role of health bodies in improving the life of citizens, the health sector is well represented in the list of proposed statutory partners, with the Health and Social Care Trusts, the Public Health Agency and the Health and Social Care Board all included. Indeed, the health sector has been very enthusiastic about the prospect of becoming involved in community planning, as previous work has shown the benefits of working together to achieve common goals and improved outcomes. 
I know that uh, the health bodies here already play a key role in the interface between public health, health and social care, and the role of the new district councils. The DHSSPS strategic framework for public health, making life better, reflects the important role of local government in helping to deliver improvements and addressing health inequalities at the community level. The joint working arrangements already in place between the PHA and district councils supporting health and well-being improvement, along with the commissioning responsibilities of HSSEB, will contribute to effective council community planning activities. Sorry, Deputy Speaker. Call Mr. McKinney for supplementary. Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I can thank the Minister for his full of answer. Um, can I ask him also, though, how to outline how the needs of people with disabilities will be taken into account in community planning? Uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I thank uh, the, the member for that question. Community planning involves integrating all areas and aspects of public life, such as the services and functions delivered in that area, and producing a plan that will set out the future direction of a council area with a focus on improving service delivery for all its citizens. To reflect the diverse nature of the communities they serve, Council's community plans will be developed by bringing together key public sector organisations as statutory community planning partners and other non-statutory support partners. These support partners might include businesses, voluntary organisations, community and other groups which make vital contributions to promoting the social, economic and environmental well-being of a district. Under Section 75 of the Northern Ireland Act 1998, all public authorities have a statutory duty to promote equality of opportunity and good relations, and the Local Government Act explicitly makes reference to this duty in relation to community planning. Equality of opportunity and social inclusion should be embedded into all stages of the process, and community planning partnerships will need to ensure that they work proactively to identify and address the specific needs of people with disabilities. Call Mr. George Robeson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. <clears throat> Mr. Deputy Speaker, could I ask the Minister, will hard to reach rural communities have a role to play in health, local government, community planning bodies? Uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And I thank uh, Mr. Robinson for his question. While I am in the process of drawing up a list of statutory community planning partners, I can't tell each and every council who they should have on their community planning partnership. Different councils will have different needs, different aspirations. Some council areas, for example, will be more rural in, in, in their makeup than others. However, I am determined to ensure that community planning ensures that all areas and all sectors and sections within these new council areas are catered for and are protected and looked after. For that reason, I, think, I do believe it is very important that consideration is given to those living in rural areas and that their I suppose, needs are represented on a community planning partnership. Call Mr Barry Michael Duff. Can I ask the Minister if senior representatives of health trusts at director level could be compelled in the community planning process to participate in that very process? And I say that because recently in OMA negative proposals have come forward regarding palliative care and dementia care, which would never see the light of day if local elected representatives were alongside health chiefs in decision making. Uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and, and uh, thank Mr. McElduff for that sensible question. Not that these questions usually aren't sensible. Well, it, as, as I outlined in my previous answer, the Department recently opened consultation on which, like, which will identify statutory partners to participate in the community planning with councils. It says health organisations are well represented in that. I believe it's imperative that they are on that list and that they have to be part of the community planning process, not least to avoid the kind of uh, recent scenarios to which Mr McElduff referred. I believe that it is in the health trust's interest <laughs> as, as much as it is 
in the interest of the elected representatives and the people that they represent, because uh, often they are, it would appear that they are making decisions based on balancing books ra rather than uh, addressing need, a need that is perhaps more acutely understood by locally elected representatives. This is a, 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 a fine, I believe, model, and I am very hopeful <laughs> that it will succeed in getting statutory bodies to work together to the benefit and for the benefit of, of their citizens and our citizens. Call Mr. Nelson McCausland. Question number five, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, so, uh, this, uh, Deputy Speaker, sorry, would, would excuse me. I had been informed that question five had been withdrawn as well, and it has now been withdrawn from my file. I uh, could have a stab at it if you want. <laughs> Okay. Sorry, okay. Minister, there may be some confusion. Topical question five has been withdrawn. Obviously, there has been some confusion. I was disappointed because for many years, or well, a few years, I had been asking Minister, or, sorry, Mr. McCausland questions, and this was his first chance to ask me one. But he was never able to answer mine either. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, the, the High Town uh, Quarry Landfill site. It's the subject of a, a recent planning application. Obviously, uh, this planning application has been treated as an Article 31 application, so ultimately it will fall to the Minister to make a decision on that application. As it is the subject of a current application, I can't go into too much detail on it and certainly not give much away on my assessment of it. However, I, I, I assure the member that the planning application will be dealt with as efficiently as possible. <laughs> All Mr. McCausland for a supplementary, well, and I'm sure the Minister will try and answer it. Uh, well, I'd be delighted if he answers the question I actually asked, which was not about a, a prospective planning application, but about his assessment of the landfill site as it is today, because having grown up in that area, I'm familiar with that area of the hill um, there just above the Horseshoe Bend as it was many years ago. The quarries have been filled in, but what we now have is a much larger mountain that's developing there. And can the, member, uh, the Minister assure me that officials have investigated that has the um, dumping at that site, the landfill at that site, been up to now in accordance with uh, what was permitted, or has it in some way gone beyond it? Because I'm surprised that it's been able to grow in the way that it has. Uh, Thank Mr. McCausland for that supplementary, or for, sorry, maybe for clarification of his original question. Maybe I let the cat out of the bag then. However, there has been a, a recently submitted planning application to extend that, that site. Uh, I can assure the, the, the member that what occurs on that landfill site is what occurs on any uh, landfill site of which we are aware is closely monitored by. NIEA and DOE officials. If there are any problems specific to that site or, or that situation that the member would like to bring to my attention, I would be happy to hear from him and have it investigated further. John, I call Mr. Alex Maskey. Question number six, please. I will not be specifying any bodies to which councils will make appointments. Section 6 of the Local Government Act, Northern Ireland 2014, lists those positions that are deemed to be positions of responsibility. This includes those requiring appointment of councillors as an external representative of the council. In other words, where a councillor is nominated by the council to serve as a member of a public body on behalf of the council. The Act defines the term public body as meaning a body other than the Council established by or under any statutory provision. There appears to have been some confusion about this, and local government sought clarification from my department. My officials have been liaising with their counterparts in other departments to identify public bodies established by 
or under any statutory provision that seek nominations from councils. The Department will provide councils with this information. Oh, Mr. Mass Keeper, supplementary. Uh, Maggot, uh, can I thank the Minister for that response? And I think it does probably continue to add to the confusion if I don't, with respect, because and maybe the question supplementary would be can the Minister give the House an assurance that he will continue to liaise with all of the other relevant ministers to ensure that there is a, if you like, a consistency as to how councils engage with arm's length bodies who you have to relate to the, the district councils in the new discipline season? I uh, thank the, the member for that uh, question and do believe it, it is important that there is a degree of consistency. However, yet again, as I had said in response to an earlier question, some different councils will have different needs and there will be bodies that are, I suppose, more relevant in some council areas than uh, they are in others. However, I can imagine that there may be some difficulties where currently members are appointed to bodies by one council and not by another, and now those two councils are amalgamating. So my officials will continue to, to work with their counterparts in other departments and also, most importantly, with uh, their counterparts in local government. Call Mr. Gregory Campbell for a supplement. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Will the, the Minister was reluctant or wouldn't outline the, the bodies that, that he would specify in the bill, but would he undertake to look at the number of terms on which uh, councillors can serve consecutively on outside bodies, which I know has been a matter of uh, some uh, concern over a number of years? I uh, thank the, the, the member for that question. As I've outlined, my uh, officials continue to work with their counterparts in other departments and uh, in local government, and I will ensure that as part of that ongoing piece of work, they ascertain the information uh, uh, to which the, the member refers. Well, Mr. Colum Eastwood for a question. Question number seven, please. <laughs> If the current draft budget proposals for my department were to be confirmed in the final budget, then there would be immediate and substantial reductions in key statutory grant payments to all councils, and particularly to those less well-off councils, dependent upon additional rate support payments to guarantee basic levels of service at local levels. Also, a wide number of grant programmes will face significant cuts and potential termination. These include Emergency planning, which provides support to councils to undertake emergency planning preparatory work. Construction products, which provide support to councils to carry out statutorily required inspection work. Local air quality, which is aimed at assisting district councils in carrying out the statutory air quality duties prescribed under the Environment Order 2002 and corresponding air quality regulations. The Rethink Waste Revenue Fund, which provides grants for councils to improve resource efficiency and boost waste prevention, recycling and reuse activity. Listed buildings, which provide support for repair works to listed buildings and council ownership. Natural Heritage, which provides support to encourage the conservation and enhancement of key elements of the environment. In respect of the Transferred Functions Grant, Uncertainty still remains whether these sums will be protected from the basis of calculation or indeed any actual cuts into the future. Well, Mr. Eastwood for a supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Can I thank the, the Minister for his answer? Um, does the Minister agree with me that it's hardly the best way to begin uh, a new council uh, structure to be cutting money to the councils that need it most? Uh, and those councils are the poorest councils. Uh, who uh, unfortunately happen uh, to be located uh, west of the ban? I uh, thank uh, Mr. Eastwood for that question and supplementary. And, and, and this is thing goes, I wouldn't be starting from here. That, 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 that's for sure. I, I would love to be in a position where I could offer an assurance to all councils, particularly to the less well off councils. However, unfortunately, I can't. The imposition of budgetary cuts of this magnitude will have a very detrimental impact on all councils at a time that they are starting a new era in local government, at a time when they do need certainty, I believe, and at a time when we here should be supporting them as best as we can. 
Uh, the impact on the less well-off councils, and, and, and Mr. Eastwood referred to the geography of the situation that they're largely in the West, is something that gives me great cause for concern too, because not only is there going to be an impact on all councils, but that impact is going to be disproportionately harsh on those who can least afford it. Well, Mr. Cattle Boylan for supplement. I could thank the Minister for his answer, but could I could ask the Minister, has he done an assessment of what impact it will have in jobs of some of these grants? Don't go to local authority or mail market. Uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and thank Mr. Boylan for that supplementary question. That piece of work is ongoing. However, I am aware that, uh, and as a member of the committee, you saw my budget paper last week and the impact that this draft budget will have on jobs within the department, leading to possibly 500 job losses. I am also aware of the impact that these cuts will have on jobs supported by my department, be they in local authorities, where I know quite a number of building control staff, for example, are supported through uh, the Construction Products Grant and the Local Air Quality Grant and the Emergency Planning Grant, be it in other NGOs, and I don't want to get into naming them now, but who are uh, supported through other grants and do valuable, I'm sorry, invaluable work in helping us meet our recycling and, uh, targets and waste reduction targets. I haven't as yet got a final figure on that, but I'm sure it will be bleak reading indeed to compound the, 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 the bleak announcements of last week, not just from my department, for, but across all government departments. Well, Mr. Pat Ramsey for a question. <coughs> question 8, Deputy Speaker. The taxi industry provides a valuable and vital service to many people with disabilities across the north providing the only means of transport for many. The introduction of a new taxi driver test is an important element of the Taxis Act. It was introduced on the 31st of October and will help increase minimum standards and professionalise the industry. Further, from September 2016, all taxi driver licence renewals will need to be accompanied by evidence of periodic training. The taxi driver test will include both a practical and theory test. The theory test will include questions specifically relating to people with disabilities. The questions have been designed to ensure that those becoming a taxi driver are trained and fully responsive to the needs of people with a disability. My department has been working closely with groups representing people with disabilities. As part of a report on a new specification for wheelchair accessible taxis, a survey of people with disabilities was undertaken. When asked what features they thought would make it easier for them to use taxis, 49% of all respondents cited better trained drivers who are more aware of disabled people's mobility assistance needs. For this reason, within the periodic training regime, the only mandatory module for all drivers will be disability awareness. The member will also wish to note that an updated wheelchair accessible taxi specification will come into force in the middle of next year. I am confident that these measures will make the taxi industry more accessible and go some length to make the journeys taken by people with disabilities safer and more comfortable. Mr Ramsey for supplementary. I welcome the very detailed response from the Minister and declare an as Chair of the Old Party Group on Disability. I think it will be encouraging and motivating for all those in our community who have disabilities who struggle with public transport the best of time and depend on taxis. Could the Minister outline the House any discussions he had with the taxi disability groups across Northern Ireland in relation to the single tier uh, system that is coming into place soon? I uh, thank Mr Ramsey uh, for that question. Within the last year, I have had countless meetings with all, or, well, representatives of all sectors of the taxi industry, as well as stakeholder groups such as Disability Action, such as the Consumer Council and MTAC, specifically to discuss the taxi reform programme and to take soundings of their views. The following stakeholders have expressed their support to me of single-tier licensing. They are Disability Action, 
the Inclusive Mobility and Transport Advisory Committee, the Consumer Council, Women's Aid, Victim Support, Belfast Chamber of Trade and Commerce, Pubs of Ulster and Visit Belfast. I made it clear in my statement to the Assembly in June that I have considered all the arguments presented to me and none have persuaded me to persist with the current dual tier system in operation in, in Belfast. The relevant legislation is nearing completion and will be made within the next month. I intend to update the Environment Committee as regards progress on taxi legislation when I, I attend their meeting this week. Order. That ends the period for listed questions. We will now move on to topical questions, and I call Mr. Patsy McGlone. Thanks very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and thank the Minister for his questions up until now. Um, can the Minister confirm that applications for large solar PV farms in open countryside are being determined on the basis that the installations are temporary, albeit for 30 years, otherwise the land would have to be rezoned? Applications for solar farms would be determined under planning policy and the relevant development plan. The current policy for all renewables is PPS 18, as the member will be aware, renewable energy. In terms of solar PV farms, the department may include conditions on any permission for the removal of the structures 30 years after connection to the grid. This may be related to the lifespan of the technology, for example. And the planning condition ensures that old, non-functioning equipment is not left in the landscape. If an applicant wishes to continue operating after that 30 years or beyond that 30 years, they would have to make a fresh planning application. The zoning of land is a function of the statutory development plan. And the reason for the temporary nature of planning permission related to solar farms is not related to the zoning of land but rather issues associated with the proposed development and lifespan of the equipment or the technology. Well, Mr. McGlone, for supplementary. Uh, <coughs> I'd like to ask uh, colleagues, uh, thanks very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I thank the, the Minister again. Um, just what assurances can the Minister give that these large solar installations will be decommissioned, the panels recycled, and the land restored at the end of this 30-year period. In other words, what I'm asking there is, can it be conditioned as part of any potential approvals that are issued? Uh, thank Mr. McGlone for that supplementary. As mentioned, if an applicant wishes to continue operating at the end of the 30-year period, they would have to make a fresh planning application. The application will be subject to the full rigours of the planning system and be assessed against the relevant area plan in place at that time, along with the prevailing planning policy and any other material considerations. If the use of large-scale installations continues without the benefit of planning permission, then the Department can initiate enforcement action against the applicant to comply with the original condition. Call Mr. Alban McGuinness. Uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Um, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, if I could ask the Minister in relation to an application uh, to assist those uh, uh, who have um, uh, suffered from ill health due to mental problems. Uh, there is a, a proposed housing development in Brookhill Avenue in Belfast, North Belfast, my constituency. It is a very interesting enterprise indeed, uh, but it has encountered difficulties in relation to restrictions on the development due to the fact that uh, demolition in town, an area of townscape uh, uh, cannot take place without uh, a, a, an alternative reason. Uh, would the Minister like to comment in relation to the application, which I believe is of great social value? Uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and thank Mr. McGuinness for that question. I have previously met with uh, the member on and around the, the, this application. Uh, the meeting was attended by uh, Mr. McGuinness 
other uh, community representatives and, quite tellingly, of service users. And I, I, I was most impressed by what they had to say. The planning application itself remains under consideration. The application seeks to replace existing specialist supported housing at Brookhill with new facilities. There are three detached buildings which may be affected. While these are unlisted, they are located within an area of townscape character. I am aware of the background of the application. As I said, I have met with Mr McGuinness and the applicants, advisers and supporters. At the meeting, it was agreed that evidence would or should be submitted to show that all other options, including avoiding demolition of the buildings, have been considered. It was agreed that, in parallel, officials would engage with the applicant's architect in relation to design issues. Amended plans have been submitted as of the 21st of October, accompanied by further information, and a further meeting between my officials and the applicants will be arranged and held before the Department presents an opinion to Belfast City Council for statutory <laughs> consultation. But I, I hope to get that done soon. Well, Mr McGuinness, for supplementary. Uh, could I thank the Minister for his uh, detailed response in relation to this application? But uh, would the Minister agree with me that uh, the social value of this application outweighs, uh, in many respects, uh, the value of retaining these buildings uh, due to their, uh, their townscape character, uh, and that this is indeed a worthy project, uh, and that the planners in such circumstances should take the view uh, that this uh, application should succeed. Well, uh, clearly, this project has potential social and health benefits as it involves the provision of modern supported housing facilities. This was very clearly articulated uh, by the many applicants, or by the applicants and their many supporters, at, at the, the meeting that we held. There may indeed be benefits in maintaining supported housing at this location, and that's something that I heard loud and clearly from those availing of the supported housing. However, the issue for planning is to assess whether it's feasible to accommodate the supported housing needs at this location while seeking to retain the, the built heritage. I believe uh, that a balance can be struck, and I am determined to strike it. And Mr Paul Given for a topical question. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Um, in my constituency, uh, and I know in other uh, constituencies, there have been tragic deaths on our roads in recent months, and the figures this year uh, make for very alarming reading in comparison to where they were last year. Uh, can the minister outline what measures uh, his department is taking uh, to try and address uh, this situation, which is a cause for concern to all of us? Uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I thank Mr. Given for that question. He quite rightly identifies the fact that, in terms of fatalities on our roads, this year has been a particularly bad one in comparison to the, the previous two years. However, I, we must also bear in mind that the previous two years were the two, two lowest years on record in terms of fatalities, and the general trend is, is one that we should look at and see how much we have improved in terms of road safety, how much we have reduced the number of fatalities on our roads over the years due to, I suppose, continued education, improved engineering and, I suppose, stricter enforcement of, uh, of laws pertaining to road safety. However, I think it is important that we do not rest on our laurels, and I can assure the member that is not what has been happening or why we have seen this drop back this year and this sad and sudden increase again in road deaths. It is strange because there has been no increase in terms of serious injuries on the roads, the increase has, has been, so, and there is no increase in terms of collisions on the roads. However, it shows just what a fine line there is between survival and, and, and death on our roads. I can assure the member and indeed the House that I remain extremely committed, if not even more committed than ever, to ensuring safety on our roads. 
Next year, I'm going to have less money to do that. However, sometimes I, I, I think necessity can be the, the mother of invention, and I'm going to have to relook at how we work with our road safety partners in order to get messages out there. And I had a, I chaired a meeting of the Ministerial Road Safety Working Group yesterday. It was attended by Minister Ford and Minister Kennedy. I'm assured of their support, and indeed. As I'm sure I have the support of all members in this House. Call Mr. Gibbon for supplementary. Can I thank the, the Minister for that response? And uh, obviously, it, ha it had been a downward trajectory for quite a number of years now in terms of uh, fatalities on our roads, uh, and that's why it is such a cause for concern uh, with the considerable increase uh, that has taken place this year. And uh, obviously, uh, the devastation that that has led uh, to those families that have been impacted by it, and I know the minister will be all too aware of that. Uh, his predecessor and ministers before him were able to use their ministerial office uh, to attract uh, media coverage and to uh, enhance uh, public awareness of this issue, which would have been uh, helpful in, in bringing it to public attention. Uh, and whilst I appreciate difficult financial constraints and implications that that may have on advertising campaigns. Uh, but could the Minister assure the House uh, that he will seek to use his office uh, in a way that will attract as much public awareness uh, to this particular issue to try and help address the problems on our roads? Uh, absolutely. I, I can give an assurance to the Member and to the House that I will use my office to do just that. And I would remind the member and indeed the House of their responsibility to use their office and any opportunity that they might have to, to reinforce road safety messages as well. The member quite rightly outlined the fact too that while we're talking about statistics, we're talking about people. And each fatality on our road represents a life lost and a family devastated. And I believe we all have a responsibility to reduce that number, if not eradicate it completely. My department has a campaign. It's called The Road to Zero. We would love to be in a position or get to a position where we have zero road deaths every year. That may sound beyond our ability, but I don't think it should be beyond our ambition. The fact is that the causation factors of many of, of, of these uh, fatal collisions remain speed, drink and drugs, and lack of attention, human error, basically. And that's why it's, it's extremely important that we continue to reinforce our messages to them. Call Mr. Oliver McMullen. I thank the Minister. Minister. When a farmer is called into the, uh, the Northern Ireland Environment Agency for interview for the use of tyres on his farm for his legitimate farming businesses, why is that farmer treated like a common criminal when he's sat down and asked to interview under caution and his interview is taped with three tapes, as you, as you would do if you were in, in the charge in, a, in a, any police station? Why is a farmer being treated like a common criminal and using tyres? Why can a, a, an ordinary face-to-face -face meeting with the agency and the farmer do instead of the formal caution that is happening today? Uh, I, I thank the, the member for that question. I am unaware of the specifics of uh, th this case and therefore can't uh, comment on the, the, the specifics of this case. However, Issues have been brought to my attention in the past around how officials, and particularly NIEA officials, con conduct their uh, work. I have commissioned uh, or ordered a root and branch review of that agency. I want to make it more customer friendly and customer focused, and certainly uh, the behaviour described by M Mr McMullen. She doesn't give the impression of an organisation that is either of those things. Well, Mr. McMullen, for supplementary. Uh, I thank the minister for his question. Indeed, that, uh, that's heartening. And that, if that uh, goes out to the farming community now, that you are conducting a written branch 
of the agency and, and, their, and their dealings. The other, the other point I would like to make, why, why when a farmer does apply to the agency to bring tyres onto his farm, that he has to pay a licence of £842, which will cover him for a three-year period. Why is the, the, the cost of that permit or licence so dear? Near £842. There is no rationale for it whatsoever. And when you're considering how much this countryside is blighted by bonfires every year, and none, nobody responsible for bonfires are being brought to book, why is the farming community being singled out, and why is the farmer having to pay £842 for a permit to bring tyres onto his farm for the farming problem? Uh, I thank the member for that supplementary question, and, and I can assure him and the House that the farming community aren't being singled out. Anyone who is handling waste tyres will be subject to the same type of uh, scrutiny and uh, uh, investigation. Uh, the, the, the rationale behind paying that licence is to attach a value actually to those tyres, because all too often tyres that are being used on farms are the very tyres that end up on bonfires. Uh, I am happy, I, I know this is an issue that, that, that the member has uh, raised previously and unfortunately was not able to be here the day that there was an adjournment to debate on this subject through no, no fault of his own, I know that. But I would happily meet him to discuss it in the future. Order. Time is up.